An underwater earthquake opens a huge gap in the ocean floor. A large volume of water moves to fill the crack. At the same time, waves start to spread out from that point. They're just a foot high at first. But the closer they get to shore, the larger they become. When the waves reach shallow waters, they start to slow down. Their lower parts get to dry land first. This creates a vacuum effect that pulls the water away from the coast. The harbor and seafloor are visible now. And then, an enormous wall of water hits the shore. It wipes out everything in its path. Several minutes later, more waves usually arrive. Or it can be a landslide happening near a large body of water. Enormous amounts of forest, soil, and rock roll down into a lake or ocean, producing huge tsunami waves. Volcanic eruptions are responsible for 5% of the world's tsunamis. They can move great volumes of water and generate really big waves. Some tsunamis are caused by meteorites striking into our planet. If one of these red-hot space visitors strikes the ocean, the force of this collision displaces enough water to produce an extremely powerful tsunami. When a tsunami starts, its waves are usually just one foot high. That's what a small wave looks like. It comes up to the waist of the average person. Surfers call such rather big waves double overhead. The largest earthquake ever recorded happened near the coast of southern Chile. It triggered a tsunami that reached Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. The tsunami's largest wave was as tall as a five-story building. The largest wave ever surfed was half as tall as the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Garrett McNamara set this record in 2011 in Nazaire, Portugal. In 1995, scientists proved the existence of rogue waves, sudden unexpected swells. On that day, they saw an 84-foot wave. It was taller than the world's largest passenger plane Airbus A380. The giant was surrounded by smaller 20-foot waves. Tohoku tsunami waves in 2011 were generated by the strongest earthquake in Japan's recorded history. The highest wave was almost as half as tall as the Brooklyn Bridge. Krakatoa's volcanic eruption in 1883 produced the loudest sound ever heard on the surface of the planet. The highest tsunami wave the eruption formed was as tall as the Statue of Liberty. April Fool's Day tsunami in 1946 was triggered by a powerful earthquake near Alaska. The tsunami's highest wave was a bit taller than the Colosseum in Rome. The Boxing Day tsunami started in the Indian Ocean in 2004. It was caused by a powerful undersea earthquake. Its tremors produced a series of tsunami waves. The largest of them almost reached the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. One of the most disastrous landslides hit Lodolin Valley in Norway in 1936. An enormous piece of rock, almost twice as large as the Eiffel Tower, broke loose and hurtled into Lovinet Lake. This caused an enormous tsunami wave. It was almost as tall as the Taj Mahal in India. 2017 Greenland Mega Tsunami was triggered by a massive landslide at one of the fjords. The waves that flooded the shore reached the height of Big Ben. A powerful volcanic eruption caused a landslide from a 4,000-year-old lava dome. This set off Unzen Volcano Mega Tsunami. The largest wave was half as tall as the Space Needle in Seattle. Fogo Mega Tsunami happened 73,000 years ago, when a part of the Fogo volcano collapsed into the sea. The Mega Tsunami's largest wave was as tall as the Washington Monument. When the upper 1,500 feet of Mount St. Helens exploded, it caused a massive landslide. A part of this avalanche plunged down into Spirit Lake. This caused a wave that was more than half the height of the Eiffel Tower. The Vejant Dam mega tsunami happened when a landslide dragged 9 billion cubic feet of forest, soil, and rock into the lake. A colossal wave overtopped the edge of the dam, taking out everything in its path. Its height was greater than that of the Golden Gate Bridge. A landslide in Latuya Bay in Alaska formed a mega wave, one of the largest ever recorded. The mega tsunami surged over the headland, washing away trees, plants, and soil down to bedrock. The wave reached more than half the height of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest construction in the world. 
A third of the East Molokai volcano in Hawaii caved in and collapsed into the Pacific Ocean. This created a tsunami the size of the second tallest building in the world, Shanghai Tower. Earthquakes are a common thing in Japan. These natural disasters can reach a magnitude 9, where 1 is a light push and 9 can destroy entire cities. This happens because Japan is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's like this. The entire surface of our planet is broken up into about 12 large pieces of the Earth's crust, and they're all moving slowly. In those places where these pieces meet, earthquakes occur most often. Japan is just at the point where the Pacific plate collides with the plate of the Philippine Sea. This collision happens underwater and creates huge waves, and it could be much worse than just an earthquake. To escape from the water disaster, people built huge walls along the entire northeast coast. Not every earthquake provokes a tsunami. Many tremors occur when the Earth's crust diverges in different directions and creates gaps. It can destroy houses, streets, and forests. But such an underwater earthquake can't cause a tsunami. Huge waves are formed only when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically up or down. The water pressure shifts at the very bottom, which generates a release of energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you can start little waves when you throw a stone into the water. And such vertical earthquakes often occur off the coast of Japan. First, a wave forms. It's gaining speed and increasing in size. Its height can reach about 40 feet, almost as tall as a five-story building. It's approaching the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is about the cruising speed of a commercial airliner. Millions of gallons of water weighing thousands of tons are getting closer. And now the wave is reaching the shore and demolishing everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. A tsunami that was that strong covered the northeast coast of Japan in 2011. It changed the landscape of the beach and the seabed. These changes are the reason for another dangerous natural phenomenon – underwater vortices. Whirlpools draw in everything that is nearby. They used to build dams along the coastline to protect coastal villages, but the wave force easily destroyed these walls. That's why, after the disaster of 2011, they decided to create new large-scale protection in Japan. They spent more than $10 billion in several years on it. As a result, they created about 440 massive walls all along the coast. They combined these sections into one large dam, almost 250 miles long and 45 feet high. The construction is supposed to protect the coast against strong tsunamis. But still, the government has moved some coastal villages to higher terrain. They also ban building anything by the shore. Despite the protection it gives them, many locals aren't happy with the wall. It's a huge problem for the fishing industry. The wall blocks access to the ocean, so ships and boats can't dock at the shore. Some people are unhappy that their windows now face the concrete wall instead of the blue ocean. The money spent on the wall could have been spent on moving even more houses. Residents have concerns the wall only creates an illusion of security. A giant wave can crash into it at great speed and break it into pieces. And these concrete parts can cause even more destruction. Some scientists agree with this opinion. Most experts aren't sure the wall won't give 100% protection, but it can help delay the flood, giving people more time to evacuate. In such situations, every minute counts. It's impossible to predict the earthquake occurrence accurately. But when it starts, the sensors can calculate how much time it would take for the wave to arrive at the shore. For example, the last time a tsunami warning was given 5 minutes after the earthquake, any big wave is moving at great speed and may be very close to the shore. It seems people almost don't have time to save themselves from a tsunami. Fortunately, the citizens of Japan are ready for this. They regularly take part in tsunami evacuation drills. They learn how to act correctly during a coming flood. They have a plan of action that can save their lives. All that, along with a wall, increases the chances of surviving a catastrophe. Not only tsunamis are formed around the shores of Japan, the power of water here often meets the power of fire. In 2010, a few hundred miles south of Tokyo, near the island of Iwo Jima, 
A heavy, low rumble came from the depth of the sea. Then a million bubbles moved to the surface. The water started heating up and boiling. Its temperature was so hot that you could poach eggs in it. The hot area grew to the size of a stadium. All this was accompanied by a huge amount of superheated steam filling all the air around. Then pieces of soil came out from the water. At this point, it was all over. The water cooled down, the ocean surface became calm again. On that day, an underwater volcano erupted. No catastrophe occurred, but in 2021, this happened again. Japan's Coast Guard warned of strong volcanic activity in the region. Hot steam and gases from the volcano's mouth burst out of the water and rose into the air to a height of 10 miles, which is about twice as high as the top of Mount Everest. A huge volcano woke up and began to rise slowly from the surface. If you look at this place from above, you can see that it's not just a volcano. It's a whole island shaped like a horseshoe. Seismologists say this volcanic island is just the tip of the iceberg, as they mix their metaphors. There is still a lot of volcanic space under the water. The island fills the air with gas and ash. The sky turns gray. Scientists continue to monitor the volcano, but they don't know what consequences this may lead to. Such eruptions of underwater volcanoes are not uncommon off the coast of Japan. But the event itself is unique. Underwater volcanoes don't explode and don't release lava flows upwards. A huge amount of water above them creates high pressure. As soon as the magma gets out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. Millions of gallons of lava sink, cool down, and solidify around the volcano. This lava forms a thick layer of Earth's rock. Most underwater eruptions don't cause any changes on the ocean surface. But to make an island appear on the surface, a volcano needs a lot of magma. The next volcanic eruption creates another thick layer of it. Millions of years pass, and flows of lava form mountains. Constant eruptions increase the seabed height. Layer by layer, the cooled lava rises higher and higher. And then, one day, it appears on the surface and turns into an island. So, in 2013, a small piece of land appeared next to an existing island. Emerging from the water, the volcano began to grow slowly and eventually connected with the island. The area of this island increased by 12 times after two years. Vapor is always pouring out of this island, and its surface is filled with super hot lava flows. The volcano behaves unstable, and nobody knows when it's going to calm down. Once, people built a small town on a similar island. This place still exists today. It's located south of Tokyo and is called Algashima. People are not too worried about the possibility of a catastrophe, despite the fact the last time a volcano erupted here was in May 1785. I wasn't around then. By that time, people had already built a city and lived there. Then, one sunny day, thousands of birds suddenly took off and left the island. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy, low sound came from the island depths. Streams of gas rushed from the top of the overgrown forest volcano. The volcano threw dirt and large stones into the sky. The eruption wasn't quick. It lasted several weeks. More than 200 years have passed since then, and the volcano is still sleeping. They rebuilt the city. Now this place looks like a dream. That's probably the reason why people don't want to leave it. Despite the risk of a new eruption, they continue to live and work here. There are many thermal springs. The island also has rich soil, and the waters around are full of fish. The volcano may wake up at any moment. Fortunately, meteorological and seismological services monitor the volcano activity. So, any guesses? Any experienced lifeguard will warn you about the scariest phenomenon a beachgoer can face. It's not sharks or poisonous jellyfish or anything like that. It's a totally natural phenomenon called a rip current. A rip is a strong current on the surface of the ocean that flows quickly away from the shore, pulling unsuspecting swimmers with it. Average rip currents move at a speed of about 1 to 2 feet per second, but really strong ones can pull you out into the open ocean at an astounding 8 feet per second. Even the best Olympic swimmer wouldn't be able to get back to the shore against such a mighty current.
A lot of beachgoers who can't swim prefer to stay in waist-deep water because they feel safe when their feet are touching the bottom. But that's no safer from these currents because a rip can easily sweep you off your feet and yank you away from the shore. If you can't swim, this can end very badly. One of the most popular misconceptions about rip currents is that they pull you underwater. In reality, a rip won't drown you, it'll simply carry you away from the shore. Another widespread myth is that if you get caught in a rip current, it'll keep pulling you into the ocean forever. Yes, a rip can pull you quite far into open waters, but even in the worst case scenario, you won't find yourself miles away from the shore. You'll probably just have to swim a pretty long way to get back to the beach. It's also entirely possible that the rip itself will bring you back. That's because 90% of rip currents move in giant circles. They flow from the shallow waters to the open ocean and then back again. There's also a misconception that if you don't see a rip current, you don't need to worry. But these things can come out of the blue, like if several waves coming from different directions crash into each other. Boom! Now you have a riptide. If the beach you're at is infamous for rip currents, always be extra cautious. To do that, you need to know how to spot a rip current. It often looks like a calm, sometimes darker patch of water between breaking waves. At first glance, it seems like the best place to enter the water. But don't let the tranquility deceive you, because you might inadvertently pick the most dangerous place to swim. The main reason many don't survive getting caught in a rip current comes down to panic. When they find themselves suddenly being pulled away from the shore at a high speed, terror ensues. They start flailing and trying to swim against the current and wear out all their strength. You need to conserve energy. Do not attempt to swim against the current towards the shore. Even the weakest rips move faster than you can swim. Don't waste your strength and energy. Remember to hold your hands up to the lifeguard's attention and signal that you need help. After that, you have two options. The rip may just spit you out into the open ocean or bring you back to the beach if it's circulating. Once you no longer feel the current pulling you, wait for rescuers or even swim back to the shore. Just make sure you're swimming around the rip. The second option will only work for really good swimmers. If you're one of them, you can try to swim parallel to the beach to get out of the current. In some cases, it's possible to break free this way. The ocean is one of the most incredible places on Earth. It's not only beautiful, but also dangerous. We all know about sharks, huge octopuses, heavy storms, and the Bermuda Triangle. But there's something more terrifying and more dangerous than all of these things. I'm talking about rogue waves. The four-passenger yacht Minionette is sailing through the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa. A storm blows through, but the yacht successfully survives it. By evening, the wind has completely subsided. The sea is calm. The team, tired after the storm, is going to rest. At this moment, seemingly out of nowhere, a 39-foot wave appears and crashes over the yacht with terrifying force. The yacht succumbs and sinks. Thankfully, the passengers escape in a lifeboat. For the next 24 days, they drift on the open sea until they're picked up by a passing ship. No one believed the stories of the surviving passengers about a huge wave. This story isn't a plot from a thriller movie, but a real event that occurred on July 5, 1884. Now imagine that you're sailing on a modern yacht in the open sea. The sun is shining brightly, there's not a single cloud. The sea is crystal clear and calm. What could be better than a vacation like this? Suddenly, you hear a very loud hum. In 2-3 to three seconds, a huge 33-foot wave appears from the calm surface of the sea and crashes into your yacht. Fortunately, the ship manages to stay afloat, and the wave disappears as suddenly as it appeared. This is also a real case that happened to the owner of the Calarin yacht on June 17, 2018. These waves have different names. White, Rogue, Wandering, Monster. The French call them a bad joke. Unfortunately, there's nothing to laugh at. A meeting with such a wave usually ends with a sunken ship. Sirens, sea monsters, the anger of Poseidon. This is how people explain the appearance of massive waves in ancient times. 
Christopher Columbus was the first to write a note about a rogue wave as a natural phenomenon. In August 1498, his team explored the shores of West India, later America, when suddenly, all of the crew members heard a deafening roar, and then a towering 88-foot wave appeared out of nowhere. Fortunately, the wave passed by, and Columbus went on his way. After that, a lot of reports were recorded about this phenomenon, but no one believed the sailors. Mermaids, kraken, and now monster waves? Come on, guys! This is the typical reaction to anyone claiming to have witnessed the nightmarish waves. Even when a 74-foot rogue wave suddenly fell on the British liner Queen Mary in 1942, the 15,000 people who lived to tell the tale were rarely taken seriously. Only in 1995 was the rogue wave officially recorded with special instruments. That day, an 85-foot wave hit the Norwegian gas platform Doppner. In order to study the nature of these waves, in 2000, the European Union created an international project called Max Wave. As part of this project, scientists launched two satellites to monitor the world's oceans. However, they ended up with more questions than answers. There's a special wave theory, according to which the larger the wave, the less likely it is to occur. Max Wave satellites manage to record waves up to 82 feet. But here's the most interesting part. Such a wave should only appear every 200 years. But satellites discovered 10 monster waves in the first three weeks of operation. 19 years have passed since then, and we still know very little about it. The worst thing is that scientists have no ideas about how to predict the appearance of these waves in advance. Modern radars and sonars have recorded the proportions of these waves. Their height reaches from 39 to 164 feet, their speed can reach 62 miles per hour, and their life expectancy is from 20 seconds to 2 minutes. Although information is scarce, scientists have managed to divide these waves into three types. The first type is the classic white wave. It appears not only in a storm, but also in a calm sea. After an unexpected appearance, it also suddenly dissolves into the water and leaves no residue. The second type is three sisters, and you guessed it, these are three consecutive waves, one of which is more massive than the others. Even a huge supertanker could break under the weight if caught in such waves. The third type is wave monster. Of all three types, this wave is the most dangerous and unpredictable. Imagine a 15-story building. The spectacle is certainly amazing, but I wouldn't want to see it in real life. Anyway, you can watch a lot of videos with rogue waves on YouTube. But after you watch our video… But what provokes these lonely waves? No one knows for sure. Perhaps rogue waves are of the same nature as tsunamis? Well, not at all. Tsunamis occur as a result of underwater earthquakes and grow as they draw closer to the coast. Some believe that they appear when the surface sea current encounters a strong headwind. Others are sure that the waves are born from the collision of warm and cold currents. Still others are convinced that it happens because of gravitational anomalies, when gravity sharply decreases or increases. There's also the theory of wave interference, small waves combining to form one big one, just like a snowball. But the most interesting theory is that waves form due to kinetic vampirism. Insert Dracula joke here. According to this version, under certain natural conditions, waves acquire the ability to exchange kinetic energy. And among all the waves, there will be one vampire wave which will absorb the energy of the others. After accumulating enough energy, the vampire wave splashes it out. This theory explains the impact force and its sudden disappearance. Some oceanographers believe that rogue waves are to blame for the disappearance of ships in the most mysterious place in the Atlantic Ocean, the Bermuda Triangle. And while it's likely that rogue waves periodically appear there, 
it's impossible to consider them the main solution to the mysteries of the triangle. Besides ships, planes disappear there, and it's unlikely that the waves can reach them. Adding even more mystery to the phenomenon, these waves appear not only in the seas and oceans, but also in lakes. They were recorded numerous times in the Great Lakes. In Lake Superior, the largest of all the Great Lakes, the appearance of the Three Sisters has been recorded several times. In addition to rogue waves, sailors have told about a more terrible phenomenon, sea hollows. Imagine that this is a very big wave, but just the opposite. It goes under the water, forming a large dip in the sea. But unlike waves, such hollows have never been officially recorded. Rogue waves can be dangerous in a similar way by forming sea holes in the water. When the wave builds up, it draws in all the water around it. So near the base, these holes can be very deep. If the bow or stern of a ship ends up in one, the ship can instantly sink. I think the Jaws movie should be replaced by a new film, Waves. Who cares about sharks now when at any moment a wave the size of a skyscraper could come rushing towards you? Hey, anybody remember the movie The Poseidon Adventure? That was a rogue wave that capsized the ocean liner. There are no ways to anticipate rogue waves, but you can significantly reduce the risk of meeting one. Study the history and meteorological records of the area you want to visit. Most often, rogue waves are found off the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean and in the North Atlantic. By the way, it was there in 1985 at the Fastnet Rock Lighthouse that the highest wave ever recorded was captured. Its height reached 157 feet. If rogue waves don't scare you and you're determined to set sail, then watch for weather changes and, most importantly, look often at the horizon. Single waves can appear in the distance, so you have a chance to evade them. And if one narrowly misses sinking your boat, well, as it goes by, be sure to wave.